In our last episode, we learned that while the United States was somewhat of a newcomer to overseas colonies, it did have plans in place to showcase the Philippines as the way that colonies should be run. William Howard Taft agreed to be the colony's governor general, and his administration began in 1900. Apart from establishing legitimacy as a foreign government, Taft had two immediate goals, implementing a national education system and establishing law and order. We will look at these two aspects of America's early rule in the Philippines in this episode. In putting together his cabinet to accompany him to the Philippines, Taft chose Bernard Moses, a University of California professor of Latin America, whose portfolio included the colony's public education. Moses had attended the University of Michigan and then earned a law degree from the University of Heidelberg. At the age of 29, he began teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, and established both the history and political science departments at Berkeley. He was known to be an expert on Spanish and South American history. He met with Taft in Washington, D.C., and together they searched for an individual who could be the colony's superintendent of education. Based on the recommendation of Harvard's president, they interviewed Fred Atkinson, who was 35 years old and had been an administrator of schools in Springfield, Massachusetts. Standing at six foot four inches and exuding confidence, ambition, and a keen desire for the position in the Philippines, Atkinson interviewed with the commission in Washington, D.C. Taft was impressed with Atkinson. Bernard Moses was not. During the interview, Atkinson exhibited very little knowledge about the Philippines, nor about how he might contextualize his curriculum and methods to fit into a Southeast Asian classroom. Moses did not want to hire him, but was overruled by Taft. It was one of the few big mistakes Taft made. The plan was to hire 1,000 American teachers and send them to the Philippines to establish schools throughout the islands. Over 8,000 individuals applied for the initial 1,000 positions. The teachers' contracts were for two years with a monthly salary of $125, which was higher than the salaries they would receive in the United States. The government also paid for the transportation of the teachers to and from the Philippines. These benefits, combined with the lower cost of living in the Philippines, made these overseas positions inviting. American taxpayers would pay for these salaries along with curriculum materials, but the local Philippine municipal governments had to use their tax receipts to pay for the building and upkeep of school buildings. Much more information on the experience of Filipinos and the American education system in the Philippines can be found in a very well-written and well-researched book by University of Oregon's historian Glenn May. His work is titled Social Engineering in the Philippines, The Aims, Execution, and Impact of American Policy, 1900 to 1913. There are four things to note about the embryonic education system in the Philippines. The first is that American education efforts in the Philippines occurred even before the first official American teachers that the Taft Commission brought to the islands. American volunteer soldiers in the Philippines were told by their commanding officers to use their free time to set up classes for Filipino children. Medics in the army were also told to use their free time to minister to the local population. American military officials wanted the Filipinos to know that they were not going to be like the Spanish who reportedly didn't pay much attention to the rank-and-file citizen. It was the hearts and minds strategy that was also tried in other foreign wars that the United States subsequently fought in Asia. The second thing to note about the American teachers was that they were going to use English in the classroom. There were practical reasons for this. 
First, it would have taken the American teachers a great deal of time to learn local dialects in order to effectively communicate with their students. The United States also decided to make English a language that would unite the Philippines. Since there was no national language and scores of various dialects, the decision was to make English the national language. Unlike the Spanish, who ridiculed the Filipinos who tried to speak Spanish, the Americans encouraged Filipinos to learn English, and it did indeed become the national language. Third, a foreign language always brings with it cultural values and unintended consequences. For example, in the English curriculum, when the students learned the English alphabet, the first page may have had a picture with the words, A is for apple. Well, there were no apples in the Philippines. After spending more than 300 years under a foreign rule that overtly looked down on Filipinos, this may have reiterated the idea of superiority by a foreign ruler as they connected the very first alphabet letter with a fruit that the Filipinos had never tasted, perhaps a forbidden fruit to the Filipinos. Finally, the effectiveness of the American teachers was mixed. In some places, the teachers became the local heroes, while in other towns the teachers denigrated the local population as dirty and lazy. As it is in every classroom, the disposition of the teacher made all the difference. Still, the number of American teachers that arrived in the Philippines made it so, as one observer noted, the U.S. performance in the Philippines was so radically progressive that other colonial powers viewed it with considerable unease. Unfortunately, the first few years of Atkinson's administration in the Philippines did not go very well. My hope is that none of you have ever experienced an ineffective administrator, but Atkinson was one of the poorest administrators in the entire American colonial system. He spent time at parties with wealthy Filipinos and did not provide the needed support to the teachers, who certainly were in need of encouragement and guidance. To make matters worse, bad reports about his leadership reached Governor General Taft right when Atkinson came to him asking for a raise. Taft wrote about his interaction to, this, to his brother Horace. He wrote, Confidentially, Atkinson is not what the commission hoped for. Atkinson has already begun to talk of an advance in salary above $6,000, which he receives. I gently intimated to him that if I were he, I would not refer such a request to the commission until he had demonstrated his ability to control the situation by an inauguration of the system of schools. I should think that such an opportunity as he has would make him think of anything but salary. He lacks, it seems to me, in force. Atkinson lasted just two years in the Philippines before he was dismissed. He was replaced by someone who had an ambitious vision for what education could do for all Filipinos. He was also beloved by the teachers and put the system back on track. His name was David Prescott Barrows, and he came from Ventura, California. He eventually rose to become the president of the University of California, Berkeley. But while he was in the Philippines, his vision was to move away from what Fred Atkinson termed practical education. Atkinson wanted to provide Filipinos with an education that was sufficient to keep them in the trenches of their rice fields and the menial tasks in the growing industrialization of the Philippines. Barrows wanted to implement a system that would give every Filipino child an opportunity to move beyond a subsistence existence. He noted at one point, two years of instruction in arithmetic given to every child will in a generation destroy the repellent peonage or bonded indebtedness that prevails throughout this country. When there was pushback by American officials and companies in the Philippines that just wanted barely educated employees, Barrows wrote, 
To those who advocate practical instruction, I reply, I reply the most practical thing obtainable for a man is a civilized community and their most desirable acquisition is literacy. The education system did get off the ground with barrows and there was for all intents and purposes a literacy rate in the Philippines that was coveted by nations in the West. Unfortunately, the centuries-long system of patron-client relationship was so deeply ingrained into Philippine society that the rich remained rich and the poor remained poor. The second immediate concern for the Taft Commission was to establish peace and order throughout the islands following the Philippine-American War. In some sense, the Philippines had been at war for almost a decade since the start of the Philippine Revolution. Then the Spanish-American War, followed by the bloodiest conflict that the Philippines had ever seen, the Philippine-American War. Taft called on fellow commissioner Luke Wright to create a legitimate and effective peace and justice system. Like many of the other early American colonial officials in the Philippines, Wright went on to have a prestigious career, including becoming the Philippines Governor General, Ambassador to Japan, and the U.S. Secretary of War. At just 15 years of age, Wright joined the Confederate Army and then following the war studied law, followed by taking the position as Memphis's district attorney. A very helpful book on knowing more in detail about Wright's paradigm is Dr. Al McCoy's work, Policing America's Empire, the United States, the Philippines, and the rise of the surveillance state. Once Secretary Wright arrived in the Philippines and surveyed the mess that 10 years of war caused, he got down to work and set up a three-pronged police system that effectively brought peace throughout the islands. The first prong of this three-headed police force centered on Manila, which was the country's major urban center and the place that experienced the most disruption during the wars. For this, he created the Metropolitan Police Force, which included 900 patrolmen and several dozen detectives. The patrolmen were almost equally divided in number between Americans and Filipinos. The second and largest of the three-pronged system was the municipal police force. This was a professional law enforcement group that policed municipalities or counties. Most of the men in the municipal force were former policemen under Spanish rule. Wright allowed the local officials to appoint the most qualified individuals to serve in the municipal police force. Of the three-pronged system, it was the municipal police force that caused Wright the most trouble. The reason for this is that local mayors saw the municipal police as their private armies. To counteract this problem, the third and final prong in Wright's system was a force called the Philippine Constabulary, or the PC. The genesis of this group was the effective use of spies, guides, and linguists that the American used in fighting Aguinaldo's soldiers. In fact, General Aguinaldo was captured due to betrayal from within his own ranks. Initially, the Philippine Constabulary was mostly populated by the American volunteer soldiers who wished to stay on in the Philippines. They were matched with those Filipinos who had sided with the Americans during the war. As each year passed, the number of Americans in the PC decreased while the number of Filipinos increased. Two things made the PC particularly effective. First, the force transcended the authority of local officials and so they had the power to deal with recalcitrant municipal soldiers or local officials who were using their local police officers for their own purposes. The second effective aspect of the PC was that the soldiers were usually known to the local population. That is, they were not outsiders, but part of the community. 
The Spanish preferred that policing be done by men not known to the local population. Thus, the local colonial authority was always seen as an outside force, even if the police were Filipinos during the Spanish time. Of the three groups, it is only the Philippine constabulary that we will refer to from this point on in our seminar. And there's a reason for that, because we now turn our attention back to the Filipinos, and in particular, one group of Filipinos that will capture our attention for the rest of our time together, and one particular American teacher from Idaho who changed the course of their history. Throughout the world, particularly in Asia, up until relatively recent history, there was a stark division between two main groups in a region, state, or country. That is, there was the majority population that lived in the lowlands, oftentimes near coasts or river systems that flowed out to oceans or seas. But then there were the minority groups who lived in the highlands, thus often called highlanders or the indigenous population. In the Philippines, these remote groups differed in culture and even in appearance from the majority lowland population. They are often called the indigenous population because they, have, they may have been the original inhabitants of the region, but when a more sophisticated and technologically more astute peoples came to their lands, they were forced to move up into the mountains. Unlike the lowlanders, Southeast Asian mountain peoples were usually illiterate and were not conquered by Western colonial governments and not part of the world religions that were brought into Southeast Asia. Outsiders saw the Highlanders as fiercely independent, dangerous headhunters, and pagans. On the Philippines' main island of Luzon, there is a 220-mile-long spine of mountains near the northern tip of the island and about 70 miles wide. It is known as the Cordillera. There are six major highland tribes that live in these mountains, mountains that reach up to 7,000 feet in height. These tribes are Bontok, Ifogao, Kankanai, Ibaloy, Kalinga, and Apayao. Each tribe has its distinctive dialect, gods, tattoo patterns, dances, and textile patterns. Collectively, these people were known as Igorots. The Igorot practice subsistence agriculture, carving out rice terraces from the mountains and also subsisting on camote, or the sweet potato. The social and religious life of Igorots revolved around feasts that were called kanyaos. Religiously, they were animists, believing that there were unseen spirits, often of recently deceased people, that could be either malvolent or benevolent. So, Kanyaos were often called for by the priests or shamans, often women, to placate an angry unseen spirit. Kanyaos were also given for weddings, funerals, and following a successful headhunting expedition. And that was the problem. The Igorots were at perpetual war with each other. At times there was peace based on a peace pact between towns, but those often broke down. Lowlanders dared not enter the Cordillera as any outsider was subjected to immediate death. For more than 300 years, the Spanish tried to incorporate the Igorot into the colonial system, but they were never successful. Priests were martyred as they tried to bring their faith to the Igorots. In the 19th century alone, there were 75 Spanish military expeditions into the Cordillera, but they were unsuccessful in controlling the region. Repeatedly, Spanish soldiers would burn recalcitrant Igorot villages, and the Igorots would just move further up in the mountains with the message and warning that you can burn our houses, but we will rebuild them. You'll not be able to get your heads back once they are off your neck. The Spanish would retreat, realizing that they were constantly in danger while in the Cordillera. 
And once America took over the Philippines, it too had to deal with Igorots, who preferred death over outside rule. And even the first American teachers feared to go into the heart of the Cordillera. All except one. And this teacher, who left Idaho for the Philippines, changed the entire area. We will learn that because he protected the Igorots against American colonial exploitation, he was fired. But a decade later, he became governor of all the Igorots at the Igorots' insistence. His name was John Chrysostom Early, and I'd like to tell you his story and the story of the Igorots as a case study of Western colonialism in Asia. But let me begin by telling you the story of how I found this forgotten man in history. Because I spent my first 18 years among the Igorots and was immersed in their culture, speaking their languages before learning English, and I wish you to know their greatness. I lived my first 18 years in the same Igorot town where John Early died, and here is how I got there. My mother was born in the same year that John Early died, 1932. She was born and raised in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, a coal mining town about 40 miles outside of Pittsburgh. An only child, her mother died when she was six, and so she was raised by a coal miner father who did the best he could. Her greatest fear was that she would never get out of Uniontown, but at 18 she made it out via the U.S. Army. She joined as soon as she could and became part of the medical branch of the Army and was stationed at a hospital in Fort Devens outside of Boston. There she met my father, who was one of ten children from a town outside of Dallas, Texas. He also joined the Army and was stationed in Germany right after World War II. Also part of the medical arm of the Army, he was transferred to Fort Devens where he met and married my mother. Following their marriage, they made a plan to quit the army and my father would go to seminary to become a chaplain in the army. But during their course of study, they changed their plans and decided to become missionaries to the Philippines. They left the U.S. in 1958 and ended up in one of the Cordillera's major population centers of about 30,000 people, a place called Baguio City. Two years later, they had their third child and named me Shelton. So I grew up among the Igorots, learning their languages at the same time, if not before learning English. Unlike the more technologically advanced times that we live in now, we did not make trips to and from the United States. My parents moved there and stayed there. My father is buried there. Apart from his training in the medical arm of the army, my father was also a pilot and had several small planes that he used to fly in to remote places to bring medical supplies and food during the typhoon seasons when villages would be cut off from the outside world for months at a time. Before I turned 19, I moved to the United States for university training and to play collegiate basketball. At UCLA, I earned a PhD in Southeast Asian history and taught there for three years before moving to Boise to become a history professor and for the past 23 years, a dean. That background is necessary to let you know the story of how I stumbled upon the story of John Early, a narrative that should never have been lost to the archives, but in many ways was purposely hidden by colonial officials. While working on my first book in 1995, I traveled to the University of Michigan to look at documents in the archives of the Bentley Historical Library. The Bentley Library might have more archival material on the first years of America's colonial rule in the Philippines than any other university library. As I recall, I had finished my three-day stay at the library, and before leaving, I went up to thank the archivist for all their help. She noticed my Boise State identification card and asked, So you are from Idaho? I said that I'd recently moved there, but I was actually from the Philippines. She then asked, 
Have you heard of John Early? He left Idaho and went to the Philippines and lived among a group called the Igorots, and he died in a place called Baguio City. He was also their governor. For a moment, I couldn't believe what she was saying. I asked if his papers were at Bentley and if anyone had ever written about him. She said they indeed had his papers, and people have said that his story needed to be told, but there was so much historical digging that had to be done that no one had ever written his story. That started an adventure that took me back to Bentley numerous times and over a dozen archives around the world. So here is the story of John Early, the Igorots, and America's rule in the Philippine Highlands. Before John Early died, he attempted to write his story. The first line of his memoir is, 1906, I was publishing a newspaper in southern Idaho called the Southern Idaho Review. In 1906, John was 33 years old, and he only had 25 years left to live. But in his 128-page memoir, he never goes back to tell us what happened during the first 33 years of his life. The reason for this is that these first 33 years resembled a bit of a train wreck, and he was so ashamed of his roots that he lied to those closest to him about his background. And here's the truth. John's family began trickling into America from Tyrone County in Northern Ireland in 1818. Extremely devoted Roman Catholics, the Earlies left Ireland's persecution and hunger to make their way to America. They eventually settled in Edina, Missouri, near the Iowa border. John's father, also named John, married Anastasia, also a devout Irish Catholic. Both of them had been born in Ireland. And they married in 1860 in Edina, Missouri. In all the census reports, John and almost his entire extended family list their profession as brick makers. In fact, this is what they did when they were in Ireland and they continued their profession in the United States. During their first 15 years of marriage, Anastasia gave birth to 10 children. John Chrysostom Early was their eighth child, and he was born on November 11, 1873. In 1880, when John was seven, the family moved to Moorhead, Minnesota. The family business did very well during their first years in Moorhead, and a newspaper article noted that they employed 16 men and in 1883 produced one million bricks. But while the professional side of the Earlies' world went well, the personal side of the family was a disaster. In April 1881, the matriarch of the family, Anastasia, died at the age of 40 of consumption or tuberculosis. She had delivered 10 children in 15 years, and all of them were living. Still, the emotional toll of losing his mother when he was just seven stayed with John, because the family tragedy was just starting. After Anastasia died, Mary, the eldest child, took over the nurturing duties of her younger siblings and was particularly helpful to John, who was just seven, and his younger brother, Alfred, who was five. The two young boys found solace in one another and their new mother figure, Mary. But just three years after Anastasia died, Mary died also of consumption. And just three months later, Alfred died of encephalitis, which is the inflammation of the brain. The deaths of the three people closest to John before he was 10 years old ever left a mark on the little boy. It is very probable that one of the reasons John never writes about his childhood was that the memories were too painful for him to recall. Like Roosevelt, who never spoke about his first wife after her death, John never spoke about the death of his mother, sister, and brother. This also gave him a certain grave affect his whole life. 
While those who did write about him spoke about his remarkable kindness and character, he was roasted in his college yearbook as a man who has the face like a benediction. As each year went by in Moorhead, the brick business seemed to lose momentum, and one by one, Early's siblings abandoned the business and moved to other states. But there were two things that distinguished John from his seven surviving siblings as they were growing up. The first was his dedication to his father and the family business. By the middle of the 1890s, John was the only one left to help his father try to save the family business. The second difference was John's dedication to education. It seems that he navigated his heartbreaks by hard work and applying himself in school. He completed high school and enrolled in two colleges. The first was Fargo College, a private institution started by the Congregational Church. He only attended that institution for a semester and then transferred to Moorhead Normal School, which is now Minnesota State University. He flourished at that institution, but his time there was cut short due to another crisis in the family. The 1893-1897 mini economic depression across the United States bankrupted the early family. Though all his siblings were gone, John and his father did all that they could to keep their farm and brick business afloat. Eventually, the banks took every asset that the family had, including all their lands, equipment, and even their house. It is at this point that John Early Sr. disappeared from the scene, and he might have moved back to Missouri to be with his relatives. It was now John's turn to decide what to do with the rest of his life. Up to this point, things had not gone very well. He had personal tragedies that scarred him. He had dropped out of two colleges, and his name was on the bank notes when it repossessed all of the earliest possessions. So he was almost 27, with very little to show for his life to this point. He then made the decision to move to the state of Washington to see if he might be able to turn the page on a life that up to this point had not been kind to him. And when we begin our next presentation, we will see how his decision to move to Washington was an important step toward his eventual adventures in the Philippines. <laughs>